Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Buntwein, erstwhile monk turned traveling medical investigator. Join me as I study the secrets of the divine plagues and uncover the blasphemous truth that ours is not a loving God and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Buntwein, wherever podcasts are available. And I had come down with a cold. But I was like, okay, well, I can still sing my song. Like, and it was, uh, look what happened to Mabel Mm. and from Mac and Mabel, which that was in my book for years and years and years. And I had to sing acapella. I was going to do maybe this time from cabaret, but I was like, no, I need to show my range because this is probably going to be a mezzo because Ari's gender fluid and they're probably going to do a mezzo alto situation. Let me show my range. So it's going great. It's going well. And I get to my big note, look what happened to, and then I opened my mouth. No sound came out. No sound came out. Hello world and welcome back to another episode of Thanks for Coming In. I'm your host, Jillian Clare. If this is your first time tuning in, this is the show where I speak to fellow actors about their journey in the industry, and I make them share a couple bad audition stories with me. It's been very exciting over here. There's a lot going on in in my life right now, Um, specifically with this fiction podcast that I'm working on called The Case Within. We have a seed and spark going on right now, and we're almost fully funded, which is wild. We still have two weeks left. It's so cool. So if you haven't checked that out, I'm going to put it down in the show notes, the link for it. I'm very excited about it, so check it out. All right, today on the show, we have a very good friend of mine. They have worked almost their entire lives, like me. Um, We have known each other well the last few years, but have been in the same circle, like, our whole lives, which is so crazy. You may remember them from Pizza with Ethan Embry, Squaresville, Complete Savages. They're in the brand new season of I Think You Should Leave. Today, we are talking to Kylie Sparks. And welcome to the show, Kylie! Hey! (laughs) That's the enthusiastic hello that we like. (laughs) How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you? Great. I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well. I'm I'm just icing my knees in between pickets right now, showing my solidarity (laughs) on the picket. Come to Universal, baby. Everybody come to Universal on the picket. So we're fun. Oh my gosh. So... Well, I'm so excited to have you here today. It's um, it's so funny for our listeners. I have only been friends with Kylie for a few years, but we ran in the same circles our entire childhood and like <laughs> somehow never connected. I know. It's the weirdest thing. I like I knew who you were because I was an Oakwood baby and you were running around with the same crew <laughs> and yet we just never met. I don't understand how that happened. <laughs> I literally, I still, to this day, I'm trying to figure out, like, how it could be possible that we were in the same place multiple times, and we still just never met. We just never met. And, like, not just, like, Oakwood, too, but, like, in the web series world as well. Web series world, auditions, I mean, events. We were always at the same stuff, and yet, somehow. We just never actually, like, met. Yeah, it literally was a pandemic. Wasn't it, uh, wasn't it Diane Hutton that introduced us, actually? My sister, because my sister was... Oh, it was, was, yes, it was your sister. I ran into your sister. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, because she had told me that you were running for um, the SAG politics. I was like, oh, well, I served, so I'd love to meet her. And then I realized, put two and two together, I was like, oh, no, I know Jillian. <laughs> <laughs> so freaking weird. It just goes to show you how, like, small LA is, and yet somehow God. it's huge. Yeah, exactly. Like, everybody knows everybody, but you might not actually know somebody. 
It's bizarre. I know that sounds so weird, but it, it really is how it feels. <laughs> it is. It is. But I mean, that brings me to my first question, which is what I always love to ask my guests right off the bat, uh, which is what made you want to become an actor? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. So, um, I wanted to become an actor. Um, so in second grade, I transferred schools and I was definitely the kid that always got made fun of and bullied and everything. But when I walked into my classroom, I guess I did one of my grand entrances like I did (laughs) to my new teacher and, uh, Susan Sullivan, who is actually to this day, a good friend of my mom since, I was in her class, but I, I think I did something like, hello, Mrs. Sullivan, when I was like, you know, first day of school or whatever. And she's like, oh, this kid's going to be an actor. And so we, um, they, the school that I went to, especially in elementary school, they were very big on play and creativity and uh, playing pretend and everything. So we had a thing called the fairy tale tea. Ooh. And I was one of the more skilled readers. So I was like a narrator for one of the stories and then I was the Wicked Queen in basically a royalty-free Snow White. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was called Snow Briar or something. No. I don't know. Oklahoma's weird. And so everybody was just like, I I mean, I loved it. It was so much fun. I got to dress up, play pretend. And I was like, oh, I want to do this more. Mm. And so my mom was like, do you want to maybe, you know, audition for um, the spotlight? And if you're not familiar with Tulsa history, which I'm pretty sure most people on this pod won't know. I, I um, do the not. Spotlight theater. The Spotlight Theater is one of America's oldest theaters. Oh. And they have had one of the longest running variety shows. I think it was, I think it did finally end during the pandemic, but um, it was called The Olio. Mm. And it was a variety show where every week, but they also had a children's theater component. Yeah. And if you were in like, you know, the community theater scene, usually your first stop was Spotlight Children's Theater. So my first audition with them, I got cast. And then it just kind of snowballed. And uh, I was, when I was 12, I got an agent in Dallas. Mm. And was it Dallas? Yeah, it was Dallas. But that didn't go anywhere because even though I, Tulsa to Dallas is a 45 minute flight. And because American Airlines is going from hub to hub, Mm. they're pretty cheap flights. um, They still wanted Texas local hires. So my mom was just like, why don't we just go to Los Angeles? Like it was, and my mom was like, do you want to go? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I started auditioning when I was 13 and it has snowballed ever since. So that's kind of how it happened. So we really have, if, if you don't like me, you have my second grade teacher to thank for getting me <laughs> in this mess. Mrs. Sullivan. Susan Sullivan. We love you, Susan. So. Wow. So you come out to LA and did you still have, uh, that agent in Dallas or how did you find your no, way? How did your I, mom find it? So this is, this is also such a wild story. When I was 12, we went to Hawaii for new year's Eve to see an NSYNC concert. And we randomly, ran okay. Into pause. Amazing. Yes, exactly. No. So <laughs> my parents separated when I was 12. So what my mom and I would do, that was kind of our thing. Like while like we were dealing with that separation is that my mom and I would go on NSYNC concert tours. So we went to Obsessed. like, Obsessed. <laughs> We started with Tulsa. We went to Dallas. We went to San Antonio where a plane caught fire. Had to emergency no. evac. No. <laughs> we went to St. Louis. And then my mom discovered that they were playing in Honolulu for New Year's Eve. Oh, my god! And we had a friend at the time who worked for American who got us um, discounted flights. And at the hotel we were staying at, NSYNC was staying there. And at the time, Lance Bass had not come out yet. And he was dating Danielle Fischel. Mm-hmm. And we... We became friends with Danielle. Like, we would always see her and she's uh, everything. And so my mom, like, on the last day of our vacation, she said, Danielle, you know, Kylie is getting into acting. She is a local. At the time, I I identified as a girl. I'm non-binary. But my mom was like, you know, they're getting into acting. Do you have any words of wisdom, words of advice or whatever? And Danielle, being the sweetest person alive, said, oh, I can just connect you with my agent. Wow. In and what so world does was, that happen? I know. <laughs> and, and like, I was like, you would think it was a fairy tale. I was like, are you kidding me? And so she at the time was represented by Judy Savage at the Savage oh, Agency. Yeah. And so we were talking with her and it just turned out that we had a misconnection. I didn't sign with her, but I did sign with an agent. And the first couple of years I didn't really, I auditioned and I did book a job, but I couldn't do it. And then the actor strike happened, the commercial strike, and then mm-hmm. 9-11. Yeah. So 
that kind of put a pause on everything, which was fine. But I got my, I ended up leaving that other agent because it just wasn't a good fit. As we all know, we have to change happens yep. every so often, but it was being an Oakwood baby that I met uh, Allison Scaliotti, who introduced me to her manager, Myrna Lieberman. And oh, Myrna wow. Lieberman was, um, I met with her. She immediately signed me on the spot. And uh, then she took me, at the time I was represent. Uh, she took me over to CESD mm-hmm. and got me signed up with them. And I started working like three months after. And, yeah. and uh, honestly, it was, that is the thing about this career that a lot of people don't get is that there are many stepping stones that may not be like, it's not a linear path. It is a Mm -hmm. lot of zigzags. Like I started auditioning out here when I was 13 uh, for all that. That was my first audition ever. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I I bombed that terribly. I did not know what I was doing. Like (laughs) I did not know what I was doing, but like from then on, you know, I got a coach. I got uh, I was with Marnie Cooper for several years. I, you know, I, I got to meet people. I got to do things and then, you know, did casting director classes, but mm-hmm. you know, all the things child actors do. Yeah. And I ended up, I ended up booking my first job when I was 16 and. And was that just, ER or pizza? No, that was pizza. That was pizza. With so Ethan Embry I, and the fantastic yes. Julie Haggerty. Yes. And Judah Friedlander and Miriam Shore and Nikki James. I mean, that cast was Fantastic. stacked. Yeah. It was stacked. And I, I still can't believe that was my first job, was a lead in a movie. Like, But, like, it goes back to what you were just saying, right? It's like there's so many stepping stones and you've put in so much work. So it looks maybe to the outsider a little strange. Like, oh, my gosh, how is this their first film or their yeah. first big job? And it's like, well, no, I've been working at this for a long time. Exactly. And that that's the thing that I think people don't realize is that there's so much behind the scenes work. You know, you mm-hmm. have to... You have to be in class. You have to constantly work on your craft. You're auditioning. Auditions are work. Yes. And that is also your class too. Like if you're running lines with somebody and you're taping something, you you have to, you know, you have to keep at it. You have to keep working at it. And it's also in different mediums too. If you want to get into voiceover, you got to take voiceover technique. Yeah. If you want to get into commercials, you have to take commercial technique. It's not just like, oh, you take one acting class and suddenly you're on Broadway or like, you know, you're in a Marvel movie. I mean, that does happen to some people, but like for most people, you for work at it. It is not. a grind. No, it's not. It's absolutely not. And then you you ended up doing a couple different like reoccurrings. You did Desperate Housewives, Complete Savages, and what was that like for you being able to carry a character on on like hit TV oh. series? Complete Savages was such a gift. It really was. I So that was my first real pilot season with Myrna and CESD. And I went in and they had to recast because like there was a conflict with one of the boys. So if you don't remember Complete Savages, folks, it was a show that ran for one season, Mm -hmm. uh, 2004 (laughs) to 2005 on ABC, uh, the, the last dying breaths of the TGIF lineup. And... I had never worked in television before. I was auditioning for a three-line co-star. And I just went in. I coached with Marnie. I went in. I did my bit. I got called back the same day. Um, And, you know, I was there with, like, a bunch of the boys and everything. But, like, because they were also doing chemistry reads for all the five boys Mm -hmm. as well because I had to recast a couple of boys. So I was there. And, like, I was, I was at Universal. They said, oh, can you come back later to do another read? And something about me, I'm a klutz. (laughs) And for the first several years of my career, I did not book a job unless I fell down. What? Yeah. Uh, So this scar right there. Yeah. uh, I got that from pizza because I tripped and fell in a pothole. And I busted my forehead open and got four stitches. Great. The day I sit in my first tape. So I run back to my mom's car. Uh, and of course we drove out here in our big PTA mom SUV <laughs> and I'm running going, I got a call back. And then like, my mom's like, Oh, and then I fell, I fell in an oil slick and I ruined my pants and I had to be back in like an hour. Oh so no. Myrna, I, I, Patty called Myrna. My mom, my mom's name is Patty. Patty called Myrna. And I was like, Kylie fell in an oil slick and ruined their pants. Can you call casting and let them know we have to go change? And luckily we were at Oakwood and I was auditioning at Universal. Super close. And so close. Thank God. 
So then I went back and then I, like two days later, I had to go to CESU to record a voiceover audition and I'm waiting in the booth. I'm waiting for my turn. And my TV agent at the time, who ended up actually being my manager for a while after I aged out of Myrna, she ran in and said, it's you. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's me. Hi. Hi, Margo. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, you booked it. You booked Complete Savages. And I was like, what? Huh? Like, my mom was just like, oh my, what? Like, we were in the booth. <laughs> and I was Amazing. like, okay, cool. And so the next week I, I went in, did the pilot, and it was one of those things I didn't realize how... I solidified my recurring role in that pilot table read because my scene was, and, and the scene was with Andrew Iden, Eric Von Detten and Sean Sipos, the three, and they were like, you know, the three high school boys, whatever. And I was to play the neighborhood bully <laughs> and kind of like a turn on the head, you know, the, the, the girl is the neighborhood bully. And I did my lines and the entire, and like, I mean, we're talking, if you've, if you've never done a pilot table read, you have network there, you have studio mm -hmm. there. There were 200 people there. The entire room could not stop laughing for three minutes. And I was just still in character. Cause I was like, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my job. And Autumn Reeser, who was also recurring, yeah. just looks at me and it's just like, like everybody after that table read, like Julie and Mike, um, Julie Thacker Scully and Mike Scully, who were the uh, co-show runners they came up to me and said well we gotta have you if the show gets picked up wow and then they had me on for uh I think I was on for a total of five episodes and they mm -hmm. were like if we get picked up for next season we'll talk about an option which if you don't know getting an option means you know getting bumped to series regular mm -hmm. because they were already talking to Autumn about an option and they're like no if we get picked up we will we will absolutely talk about an option unfortunately we were in the middle of a CEO change yeah. is the problem. So yeah. our new CEO did not care for the show and ended up canceling it. But it was that experience. I It's one of those things that I don't really realize exactly what I have done until after I've done it mm -hmm. and people like it and they want to keep me coming back. And that was kind of the same thing with Desperate Housewives is that, you know, I showed up, I did my thing and everything and I just kept getting called back. And I was like, okay, so maybe I'm just good at my job and I'm, I'm being a nice person and being kind. And I think that's really it. If you just show up and you really commit yourself to not only being a kind person on set to everybody on set, but also just being kind to yourself and your craft, that can open up a world of appearance. I mean, like I was not supposed to recur on Desperate Housewives mm -hmm. and yet they had me for three episodes. So it's it's a really cool moment to like, get to carry something that you didn't think you get you would get to carry after one day yeah well and it's funny too with complete savages because i've been friends with jason dolly like my entire life and i, I love jason i had gone to a couple of the tapings so god knows that i was probably at one of your tapings <laughs> and we still didn't meet i can how, guarantee I, it. I just i don't i still don't understand how we did not well and the best part about Complete Savages was, if you remember the dog Kelly, that was the yes. same dog that they used in The Grinch, and it was the same yes. dog that we used at Grinchmas when I played Cindy Lou Who. Oh my so god! So when I came to visit, Kelly like ran to me, and the trainer was like, "She does not do this." I'm like, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, no, Kelly was the sweetest dog on the planet. Like the best. Like, the and best. it was so funny because dogs always come up to me and like, I know Kelly was like trained to like not do that, but Kelly would let me pet her. Yeah. Like, let me like do she everything. Was great. She was the best dog. Oh my God. That's so funny that, that you also know Kelly the dog. <laughs> it's just, again, too small. Our world. world. Our world is so small. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about your, your work in the web series world because Squaresville yeah. was something that kind of hit the internet and became something big and you still have a lot of fans from that. So I'd love to know yeah. how that came about for you. Well, it's actually really funny. So Chrissy Weatherup, who, um, or Christine rather is her stage name, but I know her as Chrissy. She was in my class at Marnie Cooper. Mm. Uh, she's a couple years older than me and, um, she and her husband, uh, Matt Inlow, they were, he was working on a web series kind of thing. And, and he was big in the new media world, you know, after the writer's strike, that was kind of when digital started happening, yep. doing web series, making your own projects. And this was in 2010, by the way. And I had, uh, you know, Chrissy said, Hey, there's a, a show Matt is writing. It's a web series. I don't know if you know about web series, but we'd love to have you audition. I said, yeah, sure. That's great. And so I went in and I actually, like, they had me read, do an individual, and then I did a chemistry read, which I actually did with my friend Siri, 
Mm. And she's great. I know her from Marnie Cooper as well. Marnie Cooper School of Acting, everybody. <laughs> Best place on the planet. Uh, sourcing for all of my friends and all my co-stars. Um, so I did, a, I did a chemistry read and I didn't hear anything. And my mom actually had to have a hip replacement. I graduated college mm. and my mom had to have a hip replacement. So I was busy taking care of her. And Chrissy emailed me saying, hey, Kylie, I just want you to know you're still in the mix, whatever. And I thought nothing of it because, mm-hmm. like, my mom was, like, needing me to, you know, make her food because she couldn't get out of bed and, like, had, you know, had to get her to do physical therapy, all that. So then I went back, I think, in July to do another chemistry read with somebody else. And then I ended up just getting a, it was either a call or an email from Matt. And he said, will you be my Esther? And I was like, yo, yeah, that's great. (laughs) And it turned out that my co-star, Mary-Kate Wiles, I went to college with her. She was a year above me. But I didn't really know her because I transferred (laughs) in, but I had met her at a couple of parties. And she was part of, like, the musical theater club and everything. So, like, it was just a very small world. Like, And also, Matt and Chrissy both went to USC, too. So it was kind of, like, small world of USC folks and everything. And we shot what we call season zero on a shoestring budget. We didn't have, we didn't know if we were going to get funding from an outsider, if we were going to kickstart that first season at that point. So we shot a bunch of the season zero stuff, which is really funny because I did lose a lot of weight between season zero and season one. So there are some episodes where like, I am 30 pounds heavier in one scene. And then in another (laughs) scene, you're like, are you okay? I was like, it's fine. We shot it like seven months apart. It's fine. So I like, I shot that and then we started shooting in 2011 and it just kind of snowballed when when it premiered in March of 2012. That was kind of, that was around also when Lizzie Bennett diaries of which Mary Kate was on as well. Mm -hmm. Those both launched at the same time. And, you know, while we didn't get the, while we didn't get the, um, you know, at the right, like at the moment, we didn't get like the big burst that Lizzie Bennett did. We had the slow burn, we had the cult following and it was a really cool site to see. And I got it, you know, I was told I need to get on Tumblr. I was already on Twitter, which if you know me from Twitter, I'm so sorry in advance. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like I had to get like an iPhone to post on Instagram. Like, Oh yeah. my goodness, mother, my, I'm so sorry. My mother is texting me and I forgot to turn off my messages. <laughs> um, good. <laughs> yeah, so sorry about that. But yeah, so like it was and it was great because I got to meet a lot of different people in that world. I kind of got to learn what YouTube really was about because like I'd watch like animal videos, but I I didn't really have a good grasp of what YouTube could do. I didn't mm. know about bloggers or content creators. And so I made it my mission to really immerse myself in that world and the network that we ended up signing with that funded our second season, Big Frame. Um, they had a thing called Big Frame Fridays where talent could go and have lunch with, you know, the the network and like, you know, go meet and talk and everything. And I showed up every Friday because I wanted to learn yeah. because I came from TV and film. I don't know anything about digital. And for me, that was such a great leg up and learning about web series and then getting to be on other people's web series. Um, Willie Garson, before he passed, he had... Um, Chrissy and I and Elisa Donovan on an episode of Whole Day Down, Mm. which was a dream, a dream and a half. He was such a wonderful, wonderful dude. And it was just, it was a really cool way to kind of bridge both worlds and also create a following, which I didn't really realize I was going to need. So it kind of gave me a leg up, especially in this age of like, you know, Instagram, TikTok, you know, making your own content and everything. So it, it was great. And also with Squaresville, it was such an important story And I really wish we had been able to explore Esther's queerness because she was such a pivotal character for me to explore my own queerness because I had been suppressing it for so long and I was so afraid to come out that like I played it. I was asking all my friends who were queer and out at the time, just going, you know, how did you know? You know, I'm I'm doing this for research. And (laughs) you're like, I'm an actor. This is for research. I'm an actor. This is for research. And, you know, then several years later, yo, I'm queer. (laughs) (laughs) Yo. And then a couple years later, yo, I'm also not a girl. Like, you know, it's fine. It's fine. But that's the thing about acting that sometimes there are characters that are so, you immerse yourself in it and you discover things about you. And I wouldn't have had that. Or be be willing to be so open about who I am if it wasn't for Squaresville. We're going to take a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back. Hey. 
as a podcast network, our focus is bringing you shows you love to listen to. But we also sell merch related to those shows. And partnering with Shopify has made that both possible and simple for us to do. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor adventures, Shopify helps you sell everywhere because they've got you covered from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. What's so fantastic about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, they provide everything you need to get control of your business so you can take it to the next level. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. You can shop from anywhere doing pretty much anything. You might shop while working, eating, or even listening to this podcast. And however you shop, we all know and love the thrill of the hunt. But do you also know how to get the thrill of the best deals? Because Rakuten shoppers do. With Rakuten, they get the deals they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Sephora, Nike, and even Expedia if you're looking to get some travel in. And getting cash back doesn't mean you have to miss out on sales because those can just be stacked right on top. It's easy to use and based on a simple idea. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back through PayPal or check. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. And back to the show. And that's something I wanted to make sure that we touched on, too, because I want to make sure I give you a platform to talk about what it's like to be a non-binary actor today yeah. in this climate where I feel like more people are becoming accepting, and yet it still doesn't seem like we're even close to being where we need to be. It is one step forward, four steps back. Yeah. And that is the problem. Oh, dear. I was terrified. And I ended up all of a sudden not getting a lot of auditions. Like it was very much a, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, whatever. She's, she wasn't sending me out. And so I ended up signing with an agent who he's great. He's still my agent to this day. Mm. He's awesome. And I started going out more, but I would always go out for queer roles, which is great, but also like, you know, the inherent straight one as well, you know, from time to time. But then when I came out as non-binary, it was almost like she dropped me without dropping me. She didn't know what to do with that information. Even though I do quote unquote code female, I'm not a girl. And so I ended up leaving her and I signed with my current manager who is an angel and a half. His name is Steven Salisbury. He was a manager at Untitled. He took some time away, came back, made his own shingle. And I met him through um, a producer and a former lit manager. She actually was my lit manager. And then she decided to go back to producing um, Kendall Morgan who she actually produced Southland Tales, which oh. I love that movie. It's amazing. And so Kendall introduced me to Steven and I said, yo, I'm non-binary. I'm queer. Like our first conversation, we were talking about sneakers. Like I knew he was going to be my guy. And we've had conversations where he sent me out for non-binary roles, for queer roles. Like I don't go out for anybody straight. I am too queer to go out for straight roles. But for non-binary roles, this is the problem we're having is that there is no one way to be non-binary. There's mm -hmm. no one look. Like, femmes can be thems. Like, you know, somebody who is extremely masculine can be non-binary. Like, that is, it is, it is everybody's flavor of gender. Like, there's no, there's no, we're not a monolith. Unfortunately, the industry has not caught up to that yet. And we do have some good triumphs on that, like Sid on One Day at a Time. That actress was not non-binary, but that character was non-binary, mm -hmm. but they were femme presenting. Um, and, you know, I auditioned for Quantum Leap and Mason Alexander Park. They're fantastic on it. Yeah. But they are very androgynous and very fluid. Yes. And I'm sorry, I have boobs. I have yeah. a butt. Yeah. I have hips. And yes, at some point I will be pursuing top surgery, but 
just because I code female doesn't mean that I am female. And that is something that we're kind of figuring out. And I just, my biggest thing to the industry is like, you can cast somebody as non-binary. They don't have to be thin. They don't have to be, you know, flat as a board. They don't have to be androgynous. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, there are, I would love to see fat non-binary people on screen. Mm -hmm. That is one of the things is like, body types are so different. Let's get fat non-binary people. And, and, you know, we also have, you know, there, there are so many different types. Like, you know, also people think that being non-binary is just like a thin white person. No, everyone can be Mm non-binary and we just, we need to just spread our wings out a little bit. And, and especially now with all the anti-trans legislation more than ever, we really need trans stories to be told and Mm non-binary stories to be told. And that's one reason why I support the WGA on their strike so much is that they're trying to get these stories told and therefore trying to get at trans and non-binary actors like me cast. Yeah. And you know, it's, it is, there's a pool for everyone. That's the thing is like, if we can expand that pool, so many people can, you know, book more jobs and create more jobs and, and, you know, just have a better industry. Mm -hmm. Because I think if we stick with one idea, we don't grow, we don't spread our wings. And if we can like really expand our minds on what, you know, what something looks like in our mind, if we can expand on that, it'll be so much better for the industry. And I, I feel like I have this thing in my head that I always go back to where I feel like because this industry is so focused on like reboots and sequels and blah and blah, it's like we're not getting the opportunity to tell stories that are current to what we need to tell right now. Exactly. And and here's the thing. I know there's the barrier gaze, you know, the, you know, the queer trauma porn, you know, all that stuff, but queers are messy. <laughs> When I'm writing, that it is the messiest, queerest shit on the planet. Like, can I curse on this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's the it's it's the messiest, queerest shit on the planet. And yes, uh, my friend Lane Morgan, who uh, she uh, is a lesbian and and is a writer, or um, she wrote on Legacies. Oh yeah. She's a big like. No, I want my villains to be queer. I want my villains to be. Uh, you know, I want my queer people to be badass. I want I want us to have a whole a whole realm. And that is the problem with the sequels and the reboots and everything is that we don't get to tell the stories that show multifaceted people. Yes, we need trans joy and we need queer joy. We don't need trauma porn all the time, but you know what? People are messy. Yeah. And honestly, to me, seeing messiness on screen makes it more human. Right. It like, makes it more... we're sick of, like, the sidekick, funny, gay best friend. Okay? We're exactly. over it. Yeah, like, that... <laughs> let's have some real stories. That trope is so tired. <laughs> yes. I want the messy, f- funny, gay best friend. But I also want the gay best friend who is actually, you know, the... a, a real person. being the main character. Yeah, a real, a person. real person. Fully A real multifaceted realized. person. Yes. <laughs> Like that, and that's the thing. And like a lot of the uh, the roles I audition for for queer roles, not non-binary, but like queer female femme roles, are usually the funny gay sidekick, yep. or you know whatever. Which is fine. I will make my bread and butter on that. But we're more than just the funny gay sidekick. Yeah, we don't need queer roles to only be there to make like the straight cis girl feel good about themselves. Exactly. We're like good with at that. some point, it's like. <laughs> It's like, at some point, please just show, like, a bunch of messy queers just, like, at a bar and, like, lamenting. And then, you know, two of them go make out in the bathroom. It's like, oh, they're doing that again. Which, by the way, has happened in my life. Speaking I'm not going to name names, but you know who you are if you're watching this. Uh. Oh, so, no. But, yeah, yeah. No, my life is very funny. It's just very good. <laughs> Your Instagram is quite entertaining. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes. I mean, it's it's been a little more on the business side, which I like. Yeah. That's the thing is like when I – people ask me what my brand is and I'm like, it's like chaos. <laughs> That's just – it's I'm, gay okay, chaos. But I feel like we can get over the whole brand thing, right? Like, yes. Like we can just be who we are and like get over like I need to look like – I mean, for so long it was like, oh gosh, I, I have to be put in this box of like – I need to be like the cute pretty girl and post only photo shoot things and whatever it is for me. Yeah. And then it was like, I was like, I'm over this. I'm going to be me. Yeah. I was like, I was in that like 
you know how like there was that phase where we all were like doing like the Huji camera and like the filters <laughs> and all that and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was yeah. I I fell to that. And then when Instagram did the full pivot to reels trying to be like TikTok light, I was like, I'm just gonna post whatever I want. And yep, honestly, I've actually grown my following because I just said, I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna please the algorithm. I'm just gonna post my shit. Yeah. And and I mean, I personally like when I was younger, I didn't really like talking about the business on my socials just mm. because I find it boring a lot of the time. Like anybody who's not in the entertainment industry, like, yes, they'll find it fascinating. But after a while, it's like, oh, my God, like I'm in a I'm in a supporters group for Angel City Pandemonium and I'm, you know, in the entertainment industry. And like we have a couple of people in the entertainment industry. But like after a while, I'm like, this is so boring. Y'all yeah. are like getting your degrees in public health. Like you're a physical therapist. <laughs> like you don't need to hear this shit. And like, but that, that's also kind of keeps me very grounded because I mean, as you well know, being a child actor, you kind of feel like there are some people who feel entitled to like, yeah. you know, having a career and a following and people fawning over. And my mom was like, if you ever act like that, you're quitting. Like, mm. and, and so it's been nice to like, you know, have other hobbies other than acting and not be at my life. But lately, especially with the contract negotiations, with the pandemic, with everything, so much has changed since you and I have started mm -hmm. working that it's vital more than ever to speak up, especially about, you know, especially with contracts, like, especially with elections. Like, you know, it, it is, the workers are in solidarity with each other. And the workers include actors, they include writers, they mm -hmm. include directors. And it is so important to be on the side of the workers and to show solidarity, which is one reason why I really have started talking more about the industry from a labor perspective, because mm -hmm. I think people need to know and be transparent. And I'm all for financial transparency. Like I'll tell people what I've made on stuff because it matters that, you know, in a pandemic with inflation, people are not making the kind of money that we used to yeah and, and so rents me, rising and groceries everything is so expensive now why are eggs eight dollars okay but wait a second i went to go buy diet coke do you know that diet yeah. coke is 8.99 for a 12 pack right now at yeah it's ridiculous like, it's ridiculous what? like i my so my mom is a big sprite fan and she's like can you go pick me up a couple of sprites but then no. she'll like give me the prices at places and i'm just like no yo why is a six pack of sprite like 7.99 it's what the insane hell? like it's insane like and and that's why i'm just like this is so important to talk about yeah. like not just like the oh my god i'm gonna be so pretty and be on a show like here's my latest project whatever it's like no i'm fighting for a fair contract and my ass is on a picket right now like mm -hmm. that is that is so important and i think people are really finally getting to that point because everybody is so tired. We're yeah. all so tired. Like the amount of people I know who are staff writers who are on EBT is yeah. upsetting. Yeah. Like it's, it's so, rough. Yeah. But you know, talking about it on Instagram, especially on my story, which if you watch my story yet again, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I try and like educate people. And I just, I, I had somebody this morning send me an, uh, like a message saying, you know, I have been watching your career for so long, but honestly, I've learned so much about the industry because you are so willing to talk about it. Mm. And I think more and more people should be that way. We should talk about the industry. Yeah. And not just the pretty, pretty princess, you know, the Met Galas, the, you know, the premieres and whatever. No, it's hard work. We're doing 14, 15 hour days. Some shows you won't get OT on. Yeah. So that, you know, these are all important things we can talk about. And social media is a great place to do it. Okay, but I am going to make you now talk about the fun thing, which is that you are in the third season of I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson. Yes, I am! Um, which hit Netflix May 30th. Tell me all about it. So that is such an interesting way I got cast. Um, <laughs> if uh, some casting directors, and maybe you've had this with auditions and whatever, some shows now do a thing called block casting, where they will cast a full season of a show months prior and then they will what? call you like, yeah. So I auditioned for I Think You Should Leave in October. I auditioned for a Top of Show guest star. And I, 
it was one of those things where I've watched the show and I actually have a really funny story about Tim Robinson. <laughs> He's amazing. He's a great dude. Um, I watched the show. I tried to get the tone of it and I get my tapes professionally done by my friends, Mark and Brad. They have a great business called the actors collective. Um, and they are really affordable self tapes, like 20 bucks for 30 minutes, fully That's color corrected, bad. edited. And they, uh, they're actors too. So they know about affordability. It's not like, you know, you're paying 80 bucks for, you know, a tape studio or whatever. Right. So I got my tape done. I had fun. I completely forgot the material. And then the next week they called me for a different role. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Whatever. That's awesome that they like me. And then I didn't hear anything. And I saw what the outside dates were. And I was like, this is weird that I'm not hearing anything. Maybe they're, I don't know what's going on. I went to a rave in San Francisco. Didn't hear anything. <laughs> I came, I came back November, didn't hear anything. My mom comes back and she, my mom was in Oklahoma for two and a half years after my dad passed and she had to come back for medical stuff. Didn't hear anything. Didn't hear anything. And then December 1st, I went to go take my rent and I get a text message from my manager saying, do you want to work on, I think you should leave. And I was like, wait, did I book that? And he's like, yeah, you work tomorrow. Can you go get a COVID test? I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what? Like, it was the wildest thing. And I had already booked another, like, uh, like a small pilot presentation that I was going to film Saturday and Sunday. And so this was oh, a Friday. Right. So I, I remember was, this. This was a yes. wild weekend. This was a wild, wild, wild weekend because I was like, oh, I booked this, like, pilot presentation thing that I got asked to do. So I'm going to do that Saturday and Sunday. I got my nails done. I was, like, doing all my wardrobe, picking out wardrobe, whatever. And then Stephen calls me. He's like, do you want to work on I Think You Should Leave? I was like, mm -hmm. huh? Yes. Yes, I do. And so they ended up sending me the specs. Um, my manager closed my deal because my agent unfortunately had a health issue. So he wasn't able to finish, but my manager closed my deal. I ran to Northridge to go get a COVID test at the <sighs> Netflix site. Uh, yeah. And I had 15 minutes. Like okay. I got there with 15 minutes to spare. And I was like, oh, geez, God. Um, because they don't, Netflix doesn't let you work unless you have a negative PCR. And I mean, I test multiple times anyway, like a week just by myself because I'm high risk. But like, then they're like, okay, so because it's such short notice, can you bring wardrobe options? Like, and you know, what bring your own makeup because, and we'll apply it, but you know, because of COVID safety, because okay. they're a very COVID safe set. They're a very COVID safe set. I have never felt safer than on I Think You Should Leave because wow. everybody, Akiva Schaefer was wearing a KN90, like he was wearing an N95 strapped to his face. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and the COVID compliance officer, if your mask even fell like an inch, she would be like, no, nope, you got to pull it back up. And so it was such a great experience. It was a 14 hour day, but I had such a fun time. Um, it, it, the, the sketch is so, so, so funny too. And watching Tim do it is, it, it was, it was a really cool moment to be there and like get to see everything. I mean, my, my part, they ended up shooting the audience part first for the majority of the day. And then they would flip to me since I was the warm up comedian and do my bit. And so, I mean, I took a great nap on a couch. It was, <laughs> it was great. I had a great lunch. It was a great day. But the funny thing is, uh, four years prior at postseason baseball at Dodger stadium, Tim Robinson was sitting behind me. Oh my gosh. And because my dad at the time when he was still alive, he gifted my partner and I, um, Logan, uh, postseason baseball tickets for our NLDS because I love I love sports. If if you know me, you know you know I love sports. And um, you make I'm me big... want to love soccer. Like yes, <laughs> I come to an know Angel it, City but I game. Want to. <laughs> come to an Angel City game. Woso is so much fun. <laughs> but baseball is also great too. And I love baseball because like you can sit and eat a hot dog and a beer and like yeah. just watch the beautiful game and it's such a weird unserious sport but I love it and I all of a sudden I didn't realize I was on tv I was like behind home plate and in, in field section and I all of a sudden started getting a flurry of notifications going oh my god Kylie's on tv Kylie's on tv like Kylie's on on the NLDS game and I look and I had been standing and cheering because Clayton Kershaw of course it, it's postseason baseball if you're not standing <laughs> up and cheering for Clayton Kershaw what is wrong with you so I was like waving my towel people thought I was saying let's fucking go but I said no let's stand up because nobody else Tim Robinson is behind me just glaring at me oh my god just so mad and I was like oh okay so I've made a mortal enemy with Tim Robinson 
four years later, I work with him and he is the nicest man on the planet. And I don't think, I don't think he's he probably remembered. having a bad day. No, no. And also like I was doing, so he was wearing a UCLA hat and mm. I was doing the, uh, like, uh, like I was, for some reason, I don't remember why I was doing it, but, um, I went to USC. So I was doing one, two, three, first down Trojan. Oh <laughs> like, no. I don't know why. Yeah. So, you were trying to like really piss him off. I was really making a mortal enemy out of, <laughs> yeah. uh, out of Tim Robinson, but it ended up being like, he came up to me and he's like, Hey Kylie, your tape was so great. I'm so happy you're here. And I can't wait to have a great day with you. And oh, they shoot great. fast. I, they, they shot, I think the whole season in 18 days. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, they work fast and like, and it's, it's great because also, um, because there's so much dialogue, especially when Tim has so much dialogue, there's somebody that like, if you accidentally forget a line, they just, they say, pause, feed you the line, and then you back up and you do it again. So mm. it's not like they have to do a full cut, mm. which is really, really, really helpful because there were a couple of times where I got very, because that was the first on, on set experience I had since the pandemic started because I, I pivoted to voiceover because- I was high risk. And so I was like, well, I'll do voiceover. And then if I book a job, then hopefully they'll be safe. And that was my first onset experience since the pandemic started. And I couldn't have asked for a better experience. It was so much fun. It was, and also to kind of pull all, another full circle moment, the production designer, Elaine was our art director on Squaresville. <laughs> Love it. And, and I was walking in like, um, the second AD was escorting me over to the dressing room area. Because we didn't have trailers necessarily for that because it's it's such a smaller show mm -hmm. that they have. But they had like a green room, dressing room right. area. And so I was going to the dressing room and I just hear this, is that Kylie Sparks? And I turn and it's, I knew her as Ellie, but she goes by her full name Elaine now. And I was like, Ellie? And she's like, oh my God, I haven't heard anybody call me Ellie in like 10 years. <laughs> I was like, probably the last time I saw you actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, but no, it was a great day and it was, it was such a fun experience and everybody was so lovely and it was so great. And then the next day I worked on a show, I, I worked on that pilot presentation and I just, I couldn't stop smiling. Like mm -hmm. everybody's like, why are you so giddy? I was like, I just worked on my think you should leave. Like it's, yeah, it was great. <laughs> and, it, it, yeah. And like the hardest part was keeping that secret for so long Yeah, because Netflix is interesting on like, they don't give you necessarily like a day or a time. Like they'll tell you when a trailer drops and you can post about it. But with, I think you should leave. It's just been, Hey, new, I think you should leave this month. And I'm like, I, I'm trying to tell people, I don't <laughs> want to tell people, but I'm just like, Hey guys, you see this list? Maybe I'm on one of these shows. Crazy, like that's what I've been right? doing. It's like, I'm like, ah, uh, you know, so, but no, it's, uh, it, it's that has been the best surprise every time I told people like on the line I was like no I'm on I think you should leave this season people were like what and I was like yeah <laughs> it's cool you're like it, yeah it, ha you it has bumped me. my street cred yeah <laughs> it's bumped my street cred a little bit so That's I'm not amazing. just loud I'm also funny and loud so <laughs> well this is usually the part of the show where I ask uh you to share a audition story you've shared a couple already Oh, is there another have, that you'd like to share to the listeners? I have a cringe. Okay, great. I, cringe I love a cringe. So, and I'm a little hoarse from both soccer and being on the picket and chanting and allergies, but I am a singer. My degree is in musical theater emphasis. I've done musical theater since I was a kid. I did like talent competitions doing show tunes. So I auditioned for, you know, the show Transparent Yeah. on Amazon. Yeah. So, you know, the musical episode. Right. So I auditioned for the musical version of Ari okay. in that episode. Okay. And I had come down with a cold, but I was like, okay, well, I can still sing my song. Like, and it was, uh, look what happened to Mabel mm. and from Mac and Mabel, which that was in my book for years and years and years. And I had to sing acapella. I was going to do maybe this time from cabaret, but I was like, no, I need to show my range because this is probably going to be a mezzo because yeah. Ari's gender fluid and they're probably going to do a mezzo alto situation. Let me show my range. So it's going great. It's going well. And I get to my big note, look what happened to, and then I opened my mouth. No sound came out. <laughs> no sound came out. I was like, look what happened to Mabel. And 
I forgot who cast that. But she oh just God. gave me this look of, oh, oh, oh no. And it was in Koreatown, by the way. It was at, it, it was by the Will Turn. Oh God. And I live in the Valley. And I just went, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I just closed the door and I went down to my car and I just sat and cried for two hours. <laughs> and then I got home and I put on a unicorn onesie. And I got a box of Girl Scout cookies and I made an Instagram story where I was like this and I was chewing my, uh, my, uh, they were tagalongs. Yeah, they were tagalongs. I was chewing it and I had everything is awesome playing while I was doing it <laughs> in a sad moment. Cause I was like, I have to make content out of this. Cause like after crying for two hours, whatever. And everybody's like, are you okay? I said, I just had the worst audition of the year. <laughs> I'm like, I have been in other cringy situations, but that one just hurt. Cause I was like, I was doing great. I was like, Oh, my cold's gone, everything. And then just croak city. I was like, and it sucks when you know that it's in you as well. It's just like that one moment your body yeah. betrayed you. Yeah. That the 10 minutes prior I was doing my scales in my car and I was like, okay, can I hit this? Can I hit this? Can I hit this? Do I need to change my song? Can I hit this? And I was hitting it. I was hitting it. And then, Oh no, no sound, no sound. And I was like, so upsetting. but you know what? It's, it's great. Um, Joe Lampert, who ended up getting it, uh, she's incredible. Um, my friend Nicole is good friends with her and she's fantastic. So I'm very happy for them. And they, uh, they use she, they interchangeably. I'm, I'm very happy for them. They were fantastic in it. And, and I will say when the audition for the transparent musical at CTG came around, right. I was asked if I wanted to audition for it. And I said, you know what? You're good. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going to sit this one out. I have a little trauma. I'm going to sit this one here. out. I will come see it. Yeah. But I'm not going to be in yeah, it. You're like, I have a, I've built in trauma with this. I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah. Away. Like, that's one of those things that like I've had. I mean, I've had great audition stories, too. I ended up testing for a movie because the casting director's dog sat on uh, sat on my foot during my read. Love it. Yeah. Uh, Love but it. I mean, cringe is cringe is the name of the game. Cringe is, cringe is where we all thrive. Let's be real. Listen, um, we all grow and we all learn from yeah. cringe. Be the cringe. Be one with the cringe. Well, uh, what's next for you? I know you're writing a lot. What do you have on your yeah, slate? Um, I mean, right now we're, I mean, when this airs, we're probably still going to be in the throes of strike. And, Agreed. you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, I have been writing. Um, I've, I, I'm, I'm still also auditioning. It's such a weird line with SAG right now because we have a no solidarity strike clause. Right. So I can't just stop auditioning because I have bills. I've read. Um, I, uh, there's a pilot presentation I did called Pawns. I don't know when that is getting released. That may just be like a YouTube pilot that they're mm. trying to sell. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but the casting director on that was fantastic. And I met some great friends on there. Actually, funny story. The makeup artist lived in Logan's building for a little bit before we moved in together. <laughs> Yet again, small world. Uh, and she's great too. And um, But yeah, I have a, a, a short right now that I'm trying to get made, which we'll see if we can get it made. Like, uh, I don't know how, how this is going to go this summer. But uh, it's called Third Wheel. And it's actually doing pretty well. Uh, it is in the uh, top 25% of all projects on Coverfly right now, which is cool. Fantastic. Uh, and it's it's a messy queer story about, hey. which is is lightly based. I'm not going to name names, but she knows who she is. <laughs> uh, it's based on, an, on a time where I thought I was going on a date with a girl. And it ended up she brought her new girlfriend and wanted me to get the vibe check. Interesting. Messy queers. Messy queers. Love it. But I, I want to, I, I want to get that made, and I would like to direct it, and I'm obviously going to be in it. So hopefully, um, I have a line producer interested. So maybe we'll make that this summer. I'm writing a, a queer rom com right now because we need, we need more gay rom coms. We need more Hard gay rom coms. Um, and yeah, just auditioning, and hopefully, hopefully this summer, if we're not having hot strike summer, hopefully working more. Because I mean. I, I love what I do. Like, that's the thing is that like, I am so blessed to be privileged enough to be able to do this and be mm. able to focus on doing it. And that is, that's the thing is like, that's why this fight is so important because the residuals I've made in 2007 have still carried me. To literally. This day. Yeah. Like <laughs> literally. literally. 
Like, I was like, just talking about how Spider Man still pays for some of my bills. <laughs> like, why? Yo, yo, Desperate Housewives has been the MVP. Also, Melissa and Joey randomly. Mm, I've made yeah. so much money from Melissa and Joey. Which let me tell you, I had there was one uh, one day where I had to get my car fixed and it was like seven hundred dollars and I was like crying and I went to go check the mail and it turned out there was a new licensing agreement for Melissa and Joey and I got a residual check for seven hundred dollars. Hallelujah. <laughs> Like I, were you like, I'm that just was sign this check over to you. Grace. Yeah, no, I was just like, yo, okay. Like, it's like, oh my God, this is going to hurt everything. And I get, I, I cried. My mom's like, are you okay? It's like, no, my car just got paid for by Melissa and Joey. Like, like, that's the thing is like, I, I had like an ER check the other day for like $24 and that bought me and Logan lunch. Like yeah. we went to in and out. Like, that's the thing that I want people to realize that the fight for residuals is not just oh, we're trying to make more money or whatever. Mm-mm. No. We're trying to These survive. Su- <laughs> they're trying to survive. Like, yeah. residuals are built so that way in lean times, you can get through them and still audition mm-hmm. and not have to get a survival job, not have to, you know, take time away from your craft so you can pay your bills. Yeah. Like, that's that's the thing that I want people to realize is that we're not asking for much. We just want to be able to pay our rent. Like, I'm not going to go buy, like, a Bugatti. I just No, like, we're not going shopping at Prada. Like, let's no. be real. <laughs> like, Scarlet has, a, Scarlet, my pug, has an ear infection. Like, we need to pay for I, insurance. Yeah, the, I don't the, know the, what to tell you. vet bills. Like, you know, I, I break every five seconds. I'd like to go see a doctor and be able to pay for it. It's like, that's what it is. That's why this fight is so important, especially with streaming, is that, they're not even releasing the numbers, so we don't even know how much money we could be making mm-hmm. on residuals. So true. And that's the fight, is we want transparency and we want our fair share. I mean, even when the film that I directed was on Netflix, I never got numbers. And I would have loved to have known what my numbers were. And I and, I never got anything. And that's the same thing with Disney Plus and Hulu. They yeah. don't release the numbers. It's like, crazy. Um, good friend of mine growing up, I mean, we were both in the child actor circle in Tulsa, and she ended up becoming a showrunner. She is the showrunner of Tell Me Lies. She's the creator and showrunner of Tell Me Lies. And she just kept saying, I need you all to watch in the first week because um. numbers matter. And turns out they weren't releasing the numbers. So it's like, we need you to watch in the first week. We need mm. you to watch. We need you to watch. We need you to watch. And that's how they got a second season because – it, it is very much get out the vote, but get out the stream is basically what it is. If you want a show to survive, which, you know, if you're, if you're a queer show on streaming, you're not going to have a long life anyway, unfortunately. But, you know, that's the thing is that we want is like, if we can get numbers so we can ask for our fair share of that. I mean, Ted, give up one yacht. Come on, Ted. Like, Dave, David Zaslav, stop being courtside at the Knicks. Sit in 300 <laughs> section. Like, come on, man. Like... You don't need to be courtside. Go sit in 300 section with the rest of the people. Like, come on. So that's that's our bit. That's our big fight is like we need numbers and we need residuals and we don't want to be replaced by robots. Period. Well, yeah. it's been so great having you on the show. How can people follow you on social media? Uh, at Kylie Sparks. I am on Blue Sky now. I finally got a Blue Sky code. What's Blue that? Sky is the new Twitter. Oh, okay. Yeah. I did not know so, that. so unfortunately, if you want to leave the bird app, and yeah. go to Blue Sky. That's where everybody's migrating to because Elon Musk is terrible. Um, but yeah, I'm at Kylie Sparks on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, on on Blue Sky. I'm also on Mastodon. Uh, I, I, what are all the socials? There's Hive? There's, I don't even I, I don't know. know. I just do like Instagram and then when I need to rage tweet, I'll rage tweet. That's yeah, it. yeah. But basically just Kylie Sparks. <laughs> right now on Twitter, I am... The they them causing mayhem. So, <laughs> I love listen, that listen. So my rage, my rage right now. I got, I got that trans rage right now. So I'm, I'm and we trying to. For it. We love it, but yeah. So at Kylie Sparks everywhere on the socials. Well, thank you so much for coming on, and I wish I could talk to you for about five more hours, but I don't. Yes, want, uh, to take I your know. whole day. We actually so. do need to like go hang. I know we need to go like, to lunch. Not not just like a podcast hang, but like a hang, an actual so, lunch hang, like an actual like friend thing. Yes. Since you know we're friends now after knowing each other forever and then not being friends <laughs> until recently. Anyway, um, thank you for having me on. Thank you. This has been awesome. Yay. Yay! Thanks again to Kylie for coming on the show and spending some time with me. Check them out in the brand new season of I Think You Should Leave on Netflix right now. 
Tune in next week for another fun-filled episode with my friend Chris Mulkey. And until then, thanks for coming in. Contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Burntwine, erstwhile monk turned traveling medical investigator. Join me as I uncover the blasphemous truth of a plague-ridden world, that ours is not a loving God, and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Burntwine, coming January 2nd, wherever podcasts are available.